Welcome to the second part of the Network Softwareization Principles and Foundations class. I'm Leslie Rush. I'm here at Laval University in Quebec City, and I'll be talking to you about using CRAN in 5G. I'll be talking to you about what are the issues in rolling out greater capacity in 5G and how the ideas of network softwareization are coming into play in the cellular wireless network. So here's an outline of what we'll be covering this week. I'll start with the motivation to show you how we have gone through time through different generations of cellular to show you how these ideas of network softwareization vary or contrast with what are the typical uh, solutions in cellular. And uh, that will give a natural introduction to how the use of radio access networks came into being. So now we see wireless networks becoming access networks. And after we've gone over the description of what a physical layer radio access network looks like, uh, then we'll go into uh, the particular CRAN, which will be the focus of this week's attention. So I'll be showing you how we do the evolution from radio active uh, access networks into the CRAN. So the reason for CRAN, uh, all the goals that we're trying to accomplish by adopting an architecture such as CRAN, are based in the physical layer uh, constraints and realities for achieving the capacity and performance targets in 5G networks. So I, one of my primary goals in this section of the course is to give you a feeling for how the physical layer requirements are impacting and feeding into the uh, net, network uh, solutions that are being envisioned. So in order to do that, I'll be looking over several uh, physical layer uh, issues. The first is, uh, again, looking at the cellular, a uh, traditional cellular system, what the physical layer uh, looked like, what the solutions were, what they were able to accomplish. And as part of that sort of uh, best-known methods, I will be covering orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And I choose to introduce it here in the first week because it will be a recurring theme that we'll see throughout the three, re three weeks of this section of the course. So I'll try and take some time, start here with an introduction to OFDM, and we'll be hearing more about that uh, as we progress. Once we've looked at sort of the traditional and the best known methods, we'll go on to sort of what is the current best known methods uh, in terms of pushing the envelope, getting better performance from the physical layer. So these are the fourth generations, or uh, LTE, uh, solutions. So I'll be describing them to you so you can see how uh, this push into CRAN is being motivated by the needs of the physical layer. And one of the last physical layer properties I'll be discussing with you today is something called Massive NEMO. And this is a solution which is targeting specifically the new deployments in 5G. So I'll try to describe to you what it means. Uh, why we're moving towards that, and what the implications are. So all of this description of the physical layer requirements uh, are used to motivate why we move towards solutions that look like CRAN. But CRAN, why is it not adopted now? If I'm going to convince you, I hope by the end of, of this presentation, that it's very worthwhile, uh, very high performance, a very good solution. Well, the reason it doesn't exist quite yet is because of many issues, but one of the primary issues are the challenges in the front hall. And so I'll define for you what front hall is, contrast it with back hall, and I'll describe to you where the challenges are and where a lot of the research is going on today to try and uh, come up with the uh, underlying technologies in order to enable the solutions that we envision with CRAN. So let's go back a little bit in time and talk about cellular networks. And of course, we talk about cellular networks these days in terms of generations. So if we can think about the zero generations, well, that was uh, maybe the first time we had what was called a uh, mobile radio. And these were briefcase size, and there were very few and far between, uh, limited to military, very high corporate, 
uh, applications. They were not um, for, the, for the masses. It was in the 1980s that we came up with the first generation of cellular networks. And these cellular networks were analog. All the transmissions were analog, and the only service provided by these first generation cellular networks was voice uh, services. The popularity and uh, adoption rates for this first generation uh, cellular were, were very profitable. And of course, we were also moving into an, an more data-driven communication scenarios. So it was in 1990s that we see the adoption of the second generation of cellular networks. So these networks provided not just voice uh, links, but also some digital communications with a maximum uh, transmission rate, something on the order of 200 kilobits per second. So this was our first foray, foray into moving into both uh, voice and data. So of course, as the popularity of digital services continued to grow, we moved into the third generation. So 200 kilobits per second as a maximum was no longer considered uh, sufficient. And in the 2000s, we see the migration to the third generation of cellular networks. And this has high speed being the focus and with uh, maximum rates up to one megabit per second. So there are various technological advances uh, adopted in order to be able to increase uh, the speed of transmissions. Then more recently in 2010 we see the op, uh, adoption of fourth generation of cellular networks and for marketing reasons we call that uh, the LTE network and now we see a move towards more IP based, packet based um, transmissions and more than anywhere any time uh, ubiquitous uh, services that are being offered. And of course, the bit rate is also going uh, much higher, up to uh, peaks of 100 uh, megabits per second. So I mentioned, I think, one of the differences that we saw in transferring generations. First of all, we come from dedicated voice links, which are uh, analog into uh, voice combining with uh, digital. And of course, then we move to a packetized voice solution and uh, in general we move away from the circuit switching solutions in the earlier generations towards the adoption of packet switched uh, networks. So we have a graph here that shows you some of the economics that are impacting and of course the economics are extremely important in the development of uh, wireless services in the cellular market. So there's three uh, quantities that are being uh, developed in uh, this slide and we can start with um, the number of subscribers so this sort of dotted line that we see uh, gives uh, evolving over the years the number of uh, customers subscribing to wireless services. Uh, we also have underneath here on the bottom in these yellow uh, histogram the capital expenditure, the capex costs uh, as we go um, up in, uh, um, in years. And so uh, finally, the third plots we see, there, there are different colors that correspond to the different generations being adopted. So this is the revenue in billions of dollars uh, coming from uh, these different services. So we can see over the years how the economics have evolved. Uh, first of all, we can see this uh, really exponential growth in the number of clients, but of course this is uh, tapering off, so the number of subscribers is starting to saturate. Uh, the income, when it was voice-only services, you can only charge so much uh, the, the people were willing to pay. As we go into the 2G, now we're providing um, digital services as well, and we can see that as the uh, new second generation is being adopted, we can see the blue curve in the back is going down as people uh, terminate their services under 1G and migrate into the 2G. So we can see now the uh, beginning of the third G, 3G, when we see the uh, first rollout of the higher speed networks. And we can see how, uh, again, 
very, very steep growth in revenues, uh, corresponding to a very uh, large increase in uh, the subscriber base, and uh, a certain um, peak as we see uh, the uh, 4G coming along. So there's a natural uh, delay as uh, new handsets, new base station capabilities are brought online. So the, the generation is first introduced, but it takes some time for deployment and adoption. And uh, so now we see we're in the uh, section where uh, we have for the fourth generation services uh, taking over um, from the uh, 3G, the LTE services being the most available. So I think you'll notice um, many dynamics available in this curve, but one of them I'd like to point out is the capital expenditures that are going up uh, uh, very dramatically and very sustained uh, in order to do this uh, rollout of the base station and uh, back hall, front hall uh, infrastructure in order to uh, deploy and uh, grant these new services uh, what the new generations are allowing. So if we step back and we look at the economics not just of wireless services but in general digital services and we can think of this as how much people are willing to pay for a bit of communication services and the um, important part to observe in this is the very different levels of pricing available for different kinds of services. So if we uh, look in this little table came from The Economist magazine at let's just look at the column called the cost per megabyte. So we have a cost per megabyte varying over many 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 orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude between uh, cable video service, through voice, through mobile data, through uh, MMS, uh, messaging with pictures, and of course uh, just text messaging. And what is surprising, or perhaps not surprising, but uh, quite evident, is that the price of mobile data is the lowest. So it is the um, service for which people expect to pay the least per bit. They're not willing, uh, you know, SMS messages are very short, so if they cost 10 cents a text, uh, that doesn't seem exorbitant, but if we look uh, a bit, of course, uh, actually it's very expensive, but we're willing to pay that. But we want to get our five, uh, one gig per month of data, or five gigs, I'm not sure where, uh, I think they have five gigs here. Uh, we can see that we're uh, much more parsimonious. If we're downloading those videos, we don't want to have to pay uh, the same price as we're paying for those text bits. So this is what is putting pressure on the service providers. Uh, as people's expectations are growing on what kind of uh, service uh, bid rates they're expecting and how much it's costing the service provider uh, to furnish those. So if we look at when we're moving into the next generation, into the 5G, uh, what context are we looking at here? So from the operator point of view, we can see that there's been these increasing OPEX oper operational expenditures and capital expenditures. So they're very, very expensive systems to roll out, not only to roll out, but to maintain. Uh, most of the operating expenses, I'll be talking about that, are coming from uh, electric, uh, electricity consumption, among others. Um, so we're seeing a slow increase in income uh, because people are not willing to pay uh, exorbitant amounts or, or uh, very high rates for the services and uh, there's a big increase in expectations. So there's this Moore law, Moore's Law where we're seeing faster and faster um, electronic chips translating into faster and faster electronics and communications uh, and people expect this to continue without having to pay more which has been their experience in the past. So what are the goals of the fifth generation of uh, cellular networks vis-a-vis -vis the current state-of-the-art or the 4G current uh, consumer uh, deployed system, the 4G LTE, and we can see that the expectations are tremendously high. What we want to achieve is a thousand times capacity growth. Capacity growth is important because although we see the uh, number of clients uh, leveling off, in fact the number of devices is still going up because each client may have um, several devices. They may want to support their machine-to-machine -machine, 
and uh, the Internet of Things. So they want their service to cover perhaps many devices. And we uh, see then that uh, there will be the need to support larger and larger numbers of devices. Capacity growth is going to be offset a little bit, we hope, by opening up of some bandwidth, but it's not going to be nearly enough bandwidth available in order to achieve this. So 10 times spectral efficiency is, in to is also a goal uh, as we move forward. So I mentioned before that OPEX uh, was dominated by energy costs, and energy costs were also looking to become 10 times more energy efficient uh, in the 5G networks. And of course, there's always this expectation from clients to become uh, have uh, data which is faster and faster, which will enable new applications, uh, new requirements for service, which will be uh, generate income. So the service providers also have to uh, move to uh, increased data rates as well. So I don't know about you, but working in the physical layer, seeing requirements like this is uh, really amazing to try and improve a system by such uh, vast amounts in uh, what is hopefully uh, a short amount of time. So we can see that the stakes are high and the uh, requirements are, are, are very uh, exacting as we moved into the fifth generation of uh, cellular networks. So how do we achieve these goals, these high lofty goals? How are we going to achieve them? First of all, of course, we'll look at new technologies, new uh, ways of doing things, new devices, and also new architectures, so new ways of solving these uh, problems. And as uh, we're looking for new techniques, new architectures, we're going to take ideas wherever we can find them. And some of these ideas are coming from the classic physical layer, what I call the PHI, uh, solutions to increasing capacity, to increasing spectral efficiency. And this is uh, exploiting digital signal processing, DSP, um, in order to come up with uh, more high performance uh, receivers and uh, systems. And multiple antennas will play a very important role in uh, this, since we're looking at a wireless uh, system, antennas are going to be the key uh, to increasing uh, capacity. And I'll be talking a lot about uh, more about that today. But we're also going to take some of our ideas from the cloud. So some of the ideas that have worked so well in the backbone network uh, for delivering uh, more efficient services. So this is, when I say cloud, I'm talking about uh, centralization uh, and also the commodity hardware. So uh, wireless systems are dominated by the use of ASICs, um, application-specific instruction uh, sets. And um, these are very slow to develop and uh, expensive. And of course, if we can do uh, some of the communications on commodity hardware, uh, that would be very, very attractive. And these are the solutions that are working so well in uh, cloud, cloud services now. Software-defined networks, SDN, are also um, a place to look for ideas and how to do things better in this wireless context rather than the, the core network where SDN is, is typically uh, deployed. And what is it about software-defined networks that is attractive? It's the coordination that is available uh, inside the network in order to do optimization, to do good resource allocation. And it's also compatible with virtualization, which is another way of producing uh, greater uh, revenue streams. So as we try to achieve these lofty goals for 5G, we're going to be uh, exploiting ideas from wherever we can uh, take them. So, so far we've gone over the evolution of wireless cellular generations over time, and we've looked at the uh, requirements for the new next generation, the fifth generation of wireless cellular networks. And one of the enablers of these requirements in the fifth generation is the use of radio access networks. So we're going to start our discussion now with uh, looking back at one of the improvements adopted earlier in the uh, generation uh, three and see how this can be expanded, adapted uh, to uh, help us when we go to 5G. And so 
This is called a, a radio access network or uh, a RAN. And one of the ideas that we uh, see coming up here, which is similar to what we saw in the uh, advanced networks, the softwareization of networks, was the idea of separating functionality. In the um, data networks, it was separating the control plane and the data plane, which allowed for um, a lot more flexibility in the solutions uh, that could be found for the network. Now here in the radio access network, we're also separating functionalities, but it's different here in that for the communication system, for the wireless communication systems, we're separating the radio equipment from the signal processing equipment. And this was a solution that began in the third generation. So when I'm talking about radio equipment, I'm talking about the antennas and the power amplifiers. And when I'm talking about the signal processing, it's all of the signal processing um, the software that is being done, whether it's at the networking level, the multiple access control net level, or the MAC level, or at the physical level, the PHI. So if we look uh, at the acronyms associated with this, we'll call the radio equipment is called the RRH, or the remote radio head, and the signal processing unit is called the baseband unit. So here we have um, an illustration where we have these separation going on, but they're still co-located. They're uh, within um, one base station. So we have a little illustration here. Up at the top of the uh, tower, we have the antenna. And then we have a coaxial cable, which is taking the RF signal up to the antenna. And maybe at the base of the tower, we'll have the baseband unit. Uh, and so here is um, basically the, the base station hardware other than the antenna. And we can see uh, at this um, base station, there's a couple of functions. Some of the functions here on the right are radio frequency. So the radio frequency equipment and the power amplifier are here at the base of the antenna. And we have baseband processing, which is the processing of the information to put it in a format, which will be robust during the wireless transmission. And of course, there's uh, other uh, higher level uh, synchronization control and the transport level uh, for communicating with the, um, the core of the network uh, where the data is coming from in order to be delivered. Uh, to the antenna. So you'll see that I say it's co-located because it's at, at the same antenna tower. We put the antenna up at the top so that we don't have to change the antenna often, but if there's ever some equipment which has to be replaced, um, maintained, repaired, or updated, that's at the base of the antenna because it's easier to access. So the separation uh, is at a first level here. I want to mention that the analog signal is being transferred uh, by the um, cable here and the distance that we're allowed to put between the antenna and this uh, base station equipment is limited to a few meters and it's limited to a few meters because of the high loss of the coaxial cable so we really can't go much further. So we have the beginnings of the idea here of uh, separating the antenna and the remote radio head, but it's not quite there because here we have RF equipment and this is an analog signal that's being transferred. So the next idea, starting from just this uh, co-location of the um, uh, equipment at the base of the tower, the equipment at the top of the tower, the solution they came up with was in a just to do, create something that's more like a radio access network. We're not quite there, but we're getting there. And this is something we could call a distributed antenna. So the antenna is at the top of the tower. Now I move up to the top of the tower. All the equipment, which is at the radio frequency, the, the um, carrier frequency, which is being transmitted by the uh, antenna. So uh, all the equipment that's working at this um, carrier frequency is moved to the top of the antenna, close to the antenna, so there's very small loss in this uh, cable. Then from the RF signal, now I'm feeding this with a digital signal. So instead of using an RF cable, I can use an optical cable with very, very low loss. So now I can make 
the uh, two units. This is the remote radio head because now it's an antenna power amplifier at all of the RF carrier frequency equipment. And if this is a carrier frequency, that means that what I'm coming down here is at baseband. So this is a baseband signal which is carried in a digital format along an optical fiber up to the radio head. And the radio head takes this digital signal, converts it to analog, and, and uh, mixes it up to the uh, carrier frequency necessary for the wireless transmission. So this fiber is very, very low loss. And what that means is that I can now separate these two units, the baseband unit and the remote radio head, by up to 40 kilometers. And I stop at 40 kilometers, not because of the loss. I could, I could make it even farther with the loss. But it's limited instead by delay, both processing delay and propagation delay. It cannot be too far away from the antenna. Uh, otherwise, um, the delay will uh, make it difficult uh, to manage the wireless signals. So inside the remote radio head, uh, as I mentioned, these are analog signals and they are at very high carrier frequencies. We can see uh, here a block diagram of what's going on up at the uh, antenna site. So uh, I guess we'll start from the uh, left hand side. Here we have a box which is responsible for taking what is digital data coming in and converting it uh, to um, a signal which can go into what's over here, the digital to analog converter, so the DAC over here. And in between this digital signal and the DAC, we have different uh, signal processing. So we might have to change the sampling rate, change the um, uh, co convert, down convert, up sample, do some pre-processing. So to condition the signal so that it, when it goes to the digital to analog converter, it will be uh, in the right format to go to the right frequency uh, that's going to be um, used for the carrier. The same thing happens in the opposite direction. Uh, I'll take the radio frequency signal off of the antenna and we have to uh, convert it to analog and process it so that it can be in a format, digitize it, uh, put it in a format compatible with the protocol for communicating uh, down to the baseband unit. Now in the baseband unit, we have uh, all of the signal processing required to uh, send this wireless transmission. And if we look at the black diagram here, um, we have three different levels of signal processing that's going on. Typically these are done by ASICs, by um, application specific uh, integrated circuits. And we'll have the level three where we're doing um, the control signals for the uh, resource allocations. Then we'll have a transport level, which is dealing with the multiple access, the MAC layer, at level two. And then level one is all concerned with the uh, physical layer. And there's a great deal of processing that's going on in here. And that's why uh, most of the compute power is, is centered on achieving a good performance at the physical layer. So um, the COMP and the EICIC I'll be talking about later as being some sort of advanced um, signal processing which is going to be enabled by uh, some of our architectural changes. In the center of this L1 uh, manipulation uh, signal processing, we have all of the standard um, blocks that we see in a communication systems. There's channel coding and decoding. We'll have to quantify our system, quantize our system. Um, we have uh, maybe some multiple input, multiple output processing. I'll be talking about several of these items later on. Um, sampling, modulation, a fast Fourier transform. So many different things, and this is generic. There are many different things we could be doing. Modern wireless systems are, are very highly complex, and there are many tricks that we're doing in digital signal processing to increase performance. And at the very last box, we have the formatting necessary to prepare it to go uh, up to the remote radio head. So if we have done this idea of having a baseband unit, what the last image I showed you was one baseband unit supporting one uh, remote radio head. But instead what we can think of is a larger baseband unit 
which is actually servicing many remote radio heads. And then we can look at this as being uh, a network in and of itself. And this is what we call the radio access network. And this baseband unit uh, could uh, be quite large, quite complex. Uh, we can expand or contract it um, as needed uh, for this application. So why do we like this idea of a remote radio access network? Well, the advantages uh, may seem simple, but they allow us to choose a convenient location. And choosing a convenient location is already uh, very cost-saving because I can, uh, for instance, one of the costs uh, uh, of this uh, system is cooling. And cooling can be done at a location where it's more convenient to uh, to take care of that. And all of these, uh, being able to put it at a convenient location leads to the second benefit, which is to lower the power consumption, which lowers the operating expenses. Disadvantages, I don't know if it's a disadvantage, but it's an advantage we haven't taken advantage of, and that's that the resources are still underutilized. So in the separation of the planes, uh, pardon, excuse me, the separation of the radio equipment from the baseband equipment, First of all, the, it's the baseband equipment that has to be cooled, and so this is much more um, sensitive to the heat. Uh, we're putting them in one location, so we're not heating, down the, uh, heating up by the antenna, where it might be very expensive to do that. But we're not really addressing the problem of how a baseband could be optimized, uh, exploiting the fact that it's at another location. So a RAN is the first um, uh, evolution of the radio access network, and so its advantages are uh, somewhat uh, limited. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is uh, take a couple minutes to just highlight this format that is used uh, to transport information in a digital format along the optical fiber between the baseband unit and the remote radio head. And uh, this is uh, typically used, uh, there's a couple formats that are, are mentioned here, it's one or the other, uh, but one very common one is the CPRI, CIPRI, uh, as we like to call it, and the C is common. So it's quite common, it's the Common Public Radio Interface, and it was developed in order to have this separation of the baseband unit from the remote radio head. So it's a protocol for the transmission of digital IQ data IQ means in phase and quadrature, and these are the two dimensions of the uh, wireless uh, radio frequency signal which will be transmitted by the antenna. Um, it's, the CPRI interface is designed to support what I call front hall traffic, and I'll be defining that better, but front hall uh, basically is this connection between the RRH and the baseband unit. And it has some assumptions on the form of the baseband unit uh, when you use the CIPRI protocol. It has a specific modulation format, certain bit rate. Um, the digital uh, baseband signal will, it will have to be converted to uh, an analog signal to actually um, be transmitted across the um, uh, fiber, of course, by a binary optical modulator. So uh, there are additional equipment in the baseband unit which is assumed to use the CIPRI data. So this is uh, uh, some of the equipment. When we get to the uh, third week of class, I'll be looking at some alternatives which we have in mind for this. But for now, if we're using the CIPRI format, these are some of the assumptions in using it. So my conclusion would be that the radio access network had a lot of promise. We separated the radio unit from the baseband unit. And the baseband unit is really uh, the heart of where all of uh, our new advances are, are occurring. So it's a good basis, but we haven't done enough with it as we could. We could do more, which is where we come to the extension of the radio, act, uh, radio access network, which we call the C-RAN. And I'll be talking a little bit more about what that C really stands for. So in the C-RAN, the idea is we can go farther than just separating the RRH and BBU. And when I say go farther, I don't mean distance. When I say go farther, I mean there's much more that we could accomplish uh, with this separation, that it's actually very 
uh, rich architecture and one that we can use to, uh, to achieve uh, many of our goals. So one of the things that we do with the baseband unit separation is that we can centralize the baseband unit uh, to achieve these other goals I've mentioned. So I told you what the RAN advantages and disadvantages are and on the CRAN uh, we, we see uh, being added is uh, the idea of centralization. So naturally introducing the RAN was moving the BBUs to get BBU down when we thought of a single BBU uh, supporting several remote radio heads we can think of that BBU now as being some centralization and even though this is one architecture we could think of uh, many different architectures where we could try and expand on that and so centralization is going to be something we're going to exploit a lot in the CRAN uh, one might even think that C stands for centralization and when we do the centralization, we're going to keep the low power consumption that we had from the RAN, and we're actually going to be able to go much farther and get better uh, power consumption results, uh, results. So the centralization is going to be what helps us overcome the disadvantage of the RAN. Uh, the RAN did not take advantage of the centralization in order to optimize the allocation of resources. So the resources remained underutilized when using the RAN. And when we move to the CRAN, we'd like to see that change. We would like to see these resources uh, really being exploited uh, much more effectively. Now there's a disadvantage with the CRAN, and this is a disadvantage is that the bandwidth requirements for that front hall link between the baseband unit and the remote radio head is quite high. And that will be at the end of our discussion uh, today. So finally, I ask the question, what does C stand for? And it variously could mean many things. And its uh, different articles will uh, highlight some uh, different possible interpretations for the letter C. Let's start with cloud. So if we think about C standing for a cloud RAN, which I think is probably the most common uh, interpretation of C you're going to come across. Well, when we think about cloud, then we're thinking about this C RAN taking uh, the, the collection of baseband units, which we can call a baseband a BBU pool or even a BBU hotel sometimes, it, we can think of this as housing a cluster of general purpose processors which can do baseband processing. So uh, ASICs are the, the solution now. We're going to some um, field programmable gate arrays uh, sometimes being proposed for wireless solutions, but of course they have their own drawbacks. If we could eventually go to using it on a general purpose processor, that's the holy grail. That's really where we want to get to. Not quite the case now, but uh, definitely on the horizon. Having a cloud will also uh, create the paradigm of having uh, a system which is compatible with the virtualization of services. So when we talk about cloud, it's, it's moving the wireless uh, feed network, the front hall, into a situation where we can take the learnings from the cloud and apply it. And so this is uh, a vision about why we're going uh, to do this. Now I mentioned that the C could also be used for centralized, and it's the centralized processing. So I think this is where we can see some immediate uh, adoption, some uh, approaches which are already being used and which could be used even more in uh, future systems where we can see some economies of scale so just bringing together the processing in one place um, lets us do more processing and better processing especially since we can do coordination so we can coordinate the wireless signals from different antennas because we have centralized processing so we can take care take advantage of the centralization to create coordination. And that's why sometimes we see the C in CRAN being attributed to cooperative radio or, co or just cooperative. Um, uh, so the idea here is that the coordination uh, that we can achieve with centralization means we have uh, remote radio heads which are cooperating with one another uh, and that could take uh, various meanings. And the last interpretation of C would be to be calling it clean 
and it's clean because we can uh, reduce the power consumption so it's greener and uh, the green uh, we make it see by calling it clean so why do we make it cleaner how does the centralized and the cooperative uh, radio how does this uh, save us in processing power well in some ways we're going to be maybe trying to achieve greater performance by using more processing so maybe it won't it won't go, go down the fact that we might be able to use uh, commoditized services uh, commoditized hardware means that our hardware can be developed to be more uh, efficient but the big way that we can uh, accrete, achieve lower uh, power consumption is via statistical multiplexing and the statistical multiplexing uh, means that we can take advantage of utilization, varying utilization cycles, in order to turn off unused remote radio heads. So let's go into um, some of these advantages. First of all, let's just look at a um, sketch of what a CRAN architecture might look like. And there are many different architectures under consideration and many that could be used. It won't be one architecture necessarily. So what we see here is a collection of mobiles, uh, mobile devices which are accessing the cellular network. The cellular network has uh, a number of antennas uh, distributed geographically to give heightened coverage. At these uh, antenna sites we have the remote radio head which comprises the antenna, a little coaxial cable connecting it to the um, uh, radio head where we do the signal conditioning and the conversion from digital to analog. Then we have the front hall. Front hall is the uh, connection of these remote radio heads to the baseband unit. And here we can see we call it a baseband unit pool so that we could have a collection of devices, hopefully commoditized, very low cost, very power efficient uh, devices which are co-located uh, in one place. And it could service a number of remote radio heads and uh, if we want to make sure that we take the most of our centralization then we could imagine also having um, some backhaul which encompasses uh, connections of the baseband uh, unit pools. So from the baseband unit pools, of course, we're going to go back into the core network where we can uh, go to um, the internet, go to cloud computing resources, etc. So remember that the length of these uh, digital optical links is limited by the latency or the delay introduced uh, by the processing. We have to have the processor uh, the baseband unit calculations, etc., being uh, sufficient, suffi sufficiently uh, rapid to have good communications with these uh, mobile units. And uh, of course, there's uh, the ability to go back into the cloud for um, services which are less um, dependent, uh, latency dependent. And if there were some things that were more latency intolerant, we could think of a mini cloud even here uh, closer to the uh, baseband unit or perhaps even integrated into the baseband unit so that we could not only do baseband processing but we could even do some service providing uh, at this point also. So this is uh, the basic idea of the front hall and the back hall. I said I would, I would contrast them so we, we see the first contrast here uh, just in terms of definition the front hall is between the remote radio head and the baseband units, and the back hall takes the baseband units and connects it to all of the uh, global access which is needed by the mobiles. So let's go back to those advantages I said that we got when we expanded a RAN into a cloud RAN or a CRAN. And here is a list of what those advantages are so or what circumstances make it advantageous to use a CRAN. So the first item is the fact that mobile traffic is non-uniform and, and not just mobile but uh, traffic is also often non-uniform but particularly so in the case of cellular and I'll talk about how in, um, using a CRAN in the 
context of non-uniform traffic leads to the power savings. So that sort of goes to our next uh, point. Where do the energy savings come from? They come from a number of places, but one of the places in the non-uniform traffic. Uh, CRAN is also very cost-effective and attractive to service providers because of the ease of maintenance and upgrades. And uh, what we'll be focusing on a lot is how we can increase capacity by using the CRAN and meet those goals that I mentioned, those very aggressive goals for the fifth generation. And of course, the CRAN, uh, we hope, would uh, be able to reduce delays because we could uh, locate some processing closer, physically closer, to the mobiles. So non-uniform traffic. Base stations are designed to treat peak usage. And usage actually has a very high dynamic range. So periods of light activity could be 10 times smaller than the uh, peak uh, very, very easily. And these uh, non-uniformity comes both uh, geographical uh, non-uniformities and especially time varying uh, geographical uh, differences. So uh, just on a 24-hour uh, schedule you can see uh, of course uh, the traffic is not uniform in the middle of the night. Not many people are, are, are asking for uh, services. But we can see that in some geographic areas where we have offices, we may have very, very high demand during working hours, and that may call, uh, fall off very quickly in the evening hours. And in areas which are geographically residential, uh, we might have lower demand during uh, business hours and then go up to very high demand in the evening. So if I can take a baseband unit and centralize it for remote radio heads which service these two very different geographical areas, then I can imagine that in the office area, the business district, after uh, 8 o'clock at night there's very, very low demand. Now if I did not have a centralized baseband unit, that meant that I would have to keep my baseband unit turned on and operating all the time, operating at a point that would be able to respond to the peak usage even when there's, there's very little. If I were co-located in one place, my baseband unit and my remote radio head, I couldn't really turn it off because maybe there's one poor sucker working late at night and he needs the network and uh, they, I, I have to stay on so I can respond to him. Now, if instead I bring my baseband unit back to a pool, then I could have, I can be monitoring a demand for service at that remote radio head, but the actual CPU cycles that are being used to process data could be dedicated to that residential area. And only when I have a demand do I bring a, ser a resource and have it applied to that remote radio head. So when I talk about the ability to turn off a radio, I'm not necessarily talking about just turning off the power amplifier, but that's true. I could have turned the power amplifier off even if I had uh, not uh, uh, a CRAN. But it's instead being able to take the entire baseband unit and turn that off, which can't be done in the old, the old system. So this is a, an important area where we make big savings uh, in the operational expense um, and also in the exploitation of just the hardware that we have to be able to use it more effectively. So we call this the statistical multiplexing gain and we can quantify uh, that gain in terms of the ratio between um, the total, let's put in the denominator, the capacity I have with all of the hardware which is coming up in the baseband unit pool. So I have five baseband units there. And these five baseband units could be um, supporting you know, 10 radio heads or three, I don't know, whatever, some, some distribution. So what I look at is how um, I can uh, look at what kind of capacity I could have achieved if I had had those base, these baseband units separate and co-located with the radio head. So I have n uh, baseband units in the pool, and if I had put those on n different n poles with antennas, what capacity could I have achieved? And that ratio is the gain. 
So the gain that has been uh, predicted is what we could achieve is something on the order of 1.2 to 1.6, meaning that we could have up to 25% fewer baseband units than if we had them located uh, separately. And that's very dependent on the density of the area I'm working in. And in places like uh, downtown Tokyo, um, you could actually get much, much, hi much higher gain, much larger savings, maybe as much as 75% uh, fewer baseband units in this scenario. So another uh, advantage is scalability. So we move to the CRAND and we create an architecture which is very easy to adapt to uh, requirements. Um, we can maximize the gain, for example. I mentioned we could uh, look at uh, statistical multiplexing gain. We could try and maximize that gain by changing the mapping of baseband units to remote radio heads. And um, upgrades are also pretty easy in this uh, architecture we're talking about. So if we need to um, increase capacity, uh, we could split the cell coverage easily by just adding another antenna and uh, front hall and then taking care of the splitting and the handoffs and etc. back at the baseband units. So we could add remote radio heads, split the cell, add remote radio heads, uh, create more capacity. Um, in general, the cost of expansion is much lower because I'm not having to create a site that has to house both a remote radio head and a BBU. When I want to expand, I only have to accommodate the remote radio head, which is a lot more compact, uh, needs a lot less um, um, cooling and, and uh, protection than a baseband unit would. So I'm lowering my capex, my capital expense, when it's time to do um, an expansion. And of course having all of my baseband units in one place means that it's easy to upgrade when technology uh, is improved. So if I get a faster processor, a more power efficient processor, I'll be able to upgrade it uh, at this uh, central unit much more easily than if I had to go and uh, make an upgrade at uh, um, different geographies. And of course, the centralization means that um, I can scale also in terms of using the baseband units to do load balancing even within in the pool. So I can handle more traffic because I can load balance because I have my baseband units all co-located where uh, I can do my load balancing. And that's load balancing with the calculations to make within the pool of baseband units, but I can also uh, do some mobile load balancing in terms of which radio heads are carrying more of the wireless signals, less of the wireless signals, so I can balance that because I have the central control. All that means, if I can balance these loads, that I can scale more easily. I can grow my network uh, to the very uh, maximum of capacity. So let's look at the savings that we hope to get in our operation of the uh, network using a remote area network. First of all, up front, 80% of the capital expense is in the components which make up the radio access network. So it's important that we move towards this cloud solution where uh, part of this radio access network equipment could become commoditized and lowering cost. But let's concentrate on the energy savings, the OPEX. So 41% of the operating cost in Iran is electricity. So the electricity consumption, the energy consumption is uh, an important part of that. In the electricity, of course, some of it is going into the broadcast, the power sent to the power amplifier to the signal going over the, over the air. But still 46% of the electricity is in air conditioning. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the air conditioning is a lot more effective when we can separate the baseband unit and the remote radio head because we can choose a baseband unit um, location where it's easier to do the cooling and to share the cooling uh, by centralizing. So it's a big source of uh, savings. 
and the other one is the statistical gain that I mentioned earlier. If we can get by with fewer baseband units, we'll also be consuming less power. And as I also mentioned previously, we'll be able to power down uh, at low demand. It's possible to do this, which when we didn't have the separation was not possible. So we can maintain coverage in the pool by still powering down a good percentage uh, of the time. So the estimations by ZTE and China Mobile about how much reduction in OPEX is possible, uh, they think it could be as high as uh, 70% um, if we could go to a cloud RAN uh, type situation. But you have to add the fiber capital expense. Remember that 80% of the CapEx is in the RAN. So we have to uh, balance uh, uh, this savings in OPEX versus the cost in CapEx. And of course, um, as these systems become more mature, we hope we would be able to keep those, those costs of CapEx coming down. So I mentioned that maintenance and upgrade is easier. Um, again, this concept comes back to things I've been mentioning all along. If we have a pool of baseband units, then using the cloud concepts, we use commoditized equipment, processes that become faster, lower power can be taken advantage of more quickly. Um, we can also look at automated uh, reconfiguration. So a lot of downtime happens because of human error, um, mis, uh, misconfigurations, and if this configuration could be automated, which would be possible in this kind of architecture, um, that would also uh, lead to uh, less maintenance and better performance. And also, as we try to evolve new standards in communicating, exploiting the cloud, uh, virtualization, uh, enabling virtualization, these standards are going to be much easier to uh, deploy if we have a baseband unit pool where all of the upgrades can be taking place at, at the one place instead of distributed geographically. There's also a synergy in this with uh, software-defined radio. So software-defined radio is where we would have remote radio heads, which could be capable of supporting multiple RF standards instead of being designed to cover just one uh, RF standard. It could be able to do uh, 5G, backward compatible to 4G, maybe do some Wi-Fi. Um, so these are some ideas that are uh, being developed under software-defined radio. And this uh, CRAM with the separation of the radio head and the BBU uh, would be a good synergy for that. So the baseband unit, for example, could be uh, reconfigured, reprogrammed in order to provide the DSP that might be required for the specific RF standard, which is being um, uh, used with the software-defined radio. So maintenance upgrade greatly facilitated by a uh, changing of the architecture to the CRAN as opposed to just a simple RAN. So the last topic I said that I would be addressing is increasing capacity and how the CRAN architecture will help us uh, facilitate in increasing capacity. To do that, I'll have to look at some of the physical uh, layer enhancements, which um, we can do because of the CRAM. And to do that, I'll, I'll start by talking in general maybe about the dynamic allocation of resources. How do we, first of all, how do we allocate resources? If we want to do it dynamically, one of the enablers is something called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. So that's something I'm going to have to give you some information on in order to talk about how we can increase capacity. Um, I'll tell you some ideas which come from the LTE Advance, which we expect to propagate into the 5G realm as well. And in that, we see two ideas. It's cooperative networks and how centralization can be used. So these two uh, concepts are already uh, being exploited to a limited extent in the LTE Advanced. And the in the case of cooperative networks, it's something called EICIC, which I'll be describing to you so you have an idea about what kinds of things we can do at the physical layer um, to improve uh, in capacity. And in centralization, it's coordination, um, multi-point coordination I'll give you some examples of. And then, of course, I'll also be talking about some entirely new ideas, which we'd like to see roll out for 5G, include something, including something called the massive MIMO, massive multiple input, multiple output. So in order to uh, 
tell you about these things, I sort of have to uh, go into a whole new discussion, which is a discussion about the physical layer. So I call this section Diving into the Physical Layer. I've explained to you uh, CRAN's advantages, and one of the principal advantages is being able to increase capacity by enhancing the physical layer. And so uh, my goal now is to give you some understanding about the issues of the physical layer and the, the uh, way we uh, look to improve the physical layer so that you'll understand the impact this has on our choices for our architecture for this CRAN. In order to do that, I'll give you a little uh, primer on the physical layer. Um, start from the very general, get to a few specifics that are related directly to the uh, cellular network. So we'll start with um, the idea of multiple access. How is it that we share a media among uh, many users? And there are three dimensions which are commonly exploited. Um, the frequency domain, the time domain, and this hybrid, which we call uh, the code division multiple access. And although CDMA is an important part of uh, wireless communications, I don't think it's uh, important for the issues I'd like to explain to you today, so I'm going to try and keep it simple. Uh, for instance, let's just focus for now on the frequency domain and the time domain. So in the frequency domain, we could think of using uh, frequency division multiple access where we take the frequency domain and we slice it up into some channels which can be shared or allotted out to different users. We'll put a frequency band, a guard band in between the frequencies to prevent uh, any interference from adjacent users. Um, the frequency channel could be assigned just for one call and typically we might see one frequency used for the downlink, another frequency used for the uplink. And here in the bottom we see a little uh, illustration of a typical cellular system laid out in a hexagonal pattern to cover a geographical area. So traditional base station, traditional I mean older generations, we had the baseband unit co-located with the antennas a few meters connected by a, uh, a coax and this is um, used in 1G and 2G. And then uh, this hexagonal deployment of the base stations was to enable um, frequency reuse patterns. So a convenient way to um, take a limited collection of frequencies and pass them out to the various users. Uh, the backhaul would be to the core network or the sites interconnecting um, the base stations. So in this case, uh, we would have an assignment, for instance, of frequencies such as this in the hexagonal um, uh, locations of the base stations. For instance, uh, if I used uh, frequency A at this cell, I would wait a certain distance before I reused this frequency uh, at another cell site. And uh, you can see that the um, frequency patterns uh, are, are developed in order to keep interference between cell stations to a minimum. So that was how we did it in the uh, first generations, how we would use frequency division multiple access. Of course within that we could also use time slots and um, we do this for time division multiple access so um, there's one transmission per slot. We dynamically allocate time slots to different mobiles and there's no competition for these time slots in the cellular network. It's not like the carrier sends multiple access you might see in the Wi-Fi systems or in Ethernet. So uh, we can divide um, the available frequency slots and we could also take advantage of silences in conversations to do some time division multiplexing as well. Now there's some um, sort of another hybrid kind of uh, understanding about um, these frequency time domain which is called orthogonal frequency division multiple access or OFDM. And I mentioned OFDM in particular, and it's one uh, area that I'm going to go into in more detail. And that's uh, because it provides a very flexible solution for resource allocation. So this will be true um, in the wireless domain and also in the optical domain. So OFDM 
has a number of technical advantages for which it is used as sort of the go-to modulation format. Um, for the wireless, it's very robust against the vagaries of the wireless channel, which I mean that theirs could be severe fading. We could go from line of sight to non-line of sight. The channel could change um, very greatly. And uh, OFDM is a solution which, which reacts well to this kind of uh, environment. Uh, it's also um, uh, an efficient way. We have to equalize these changes, and OFDM gives us a framework. Not only is it robust, but when we try to combat it, it's uh, a format that's very efficient, uh, computationally efficient, um, and toward, try to equalize those uh, variability that we see in the wireless channel. And it's uh, a very well-known system, OFDM, for which there are excellent hardware and DSP solutions and tools. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is why it's a go-to solution for, for wireless, and one that we're also looking now in optical. So, uh, OFDM is, is starting to migrate into optical formats as well as we're seeing it uh, in the wireless format. So what is OFDM? How does it differ from what I mentioned earlier, which was frequency division multiple access? So in frequency division multiple access, we generally are talking about physical entities which are, are, are located at different places. For instance, mobile devices. So I could assign one channel to one mobile, another channel to another mobile, and these two mobiles are physically separated. Um, so they could be a, an assignment per user, it could also be an assignment per location. And uh, in order to use them effectively, uh, because of these uh, differences, the lack of co-location, uh, we definitely need guard bands, and sometimes some rather large guard bands. Now OFDM is typically used at, at one site, and in this case the division in frequencies is more virtual than it is real. Uh, in the case of FDMA, we're talking typically about um, tuning uh, an oscillator to a specific frequency. And in the case of OFDM, as I'll be explaining it, um, that's not really what's going on. Um, there are no guard bands in OFDM. The O is for orthogonal, and the orthogonality uh, allows us to eliminate uh, guard bands, so it's very spectrally efficient. So this is another aspect of uh, OFDM which has led to its um, very widespread adoption. So if we use the fact that we don't need guard bands, then we get the very uh, spectrally efficient by actually being able to overlap uh, the uh, data uh, carriers here um, and, and uh, tight, uh, pack them as tightly as possible, which gives us uh, the bandwidth savings it leads to this very spectrally efficient. So I said that OFDM was virtual um, division of frequencies. And what did I mean by that, virtual in what way? So to understand that, I have to think about taking your stream of uh, data bits and separating the bits, uh, doing a conversion to put them in parallel rather than serial, rather than being one after the other. And now when I look at the output of this serial to parallel converter, I've got these bits lined up, and it's time to transfer them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of those bits and assign it to a subcarrier frequency, to some very narrow frequency band. So one after the other, I'm assigning this data onto a carrier. So, okay, that's a concept, but how do I realize this concept of assigning a bit to a, a frequency? And the way I do that is very simple. I use a fast Fourier transform, in fact, an inverse fast Fourier transform. Essentially, I'm taking a vector of bits and I'm transferring it to this uh, DSP unit. And I'm taking uh, this vector of bits and I'm performing an inverse Fourier transform, which means I'm interpreting these bits as modulating uh, one uh, entry in the IFFT, the, which is interpreted as one frequency. So that means that the output of the IFFT, I'm going to take the output, it's a digital, it's another vector. So I take a vector in, in the frequency domain, I get a vector out in the time domain. And I take that vector and I convert it uh, from digital to an analog form and send it up on an antenna. And so if I look at what's going on on that antenna in the time domain, I get um, a symbol, or an OFDM symbol, which looks... Um, 
very irregular. So here in the frequency domain, I could see um, a modulation, maybe a binary or, or other kinds of modulations I could do. But when I look in the time domain, it's a lot less obvious what's going on here. So what happens when I get to the receiver in order to recover my data? What I do is, of course, it goes to an antenna, and that antenna receives an analog signal. We convert the analog to digital, and so now I have a vector of time domain signals, which I put into the FFT, and the FFT, of course, uh, spits out the um, frequency domain uh, coefficients, and now these coefficients I know are my data and so I just do a conversion parallel back to serial. So the virtual is in that um, there's never any uh, individual frequency sources for all of this. There's only one central carrier which is modulated by the entire uh, time domain signal which comes out of this inverse uh, fast Fourier transform. So there's one real frequency but there could be a thousand, a couple thousand uh, subcarriers or virtual frequencies which are being modulated uh, uh, by this um, parallel stream of data. Of course what's going on is a bit more complicated than that. There are a lot more uh, boxes in order to make um, this a very practical uh, system, but uh, these are all um, digital signal processing operations, uh, maybe some forward error correcting coding, some interleaving. I might use a uh, higher order modulation format in order to get many bits per symbol. Uh, of course I have to do some synchronization for that. I'm going to need some pilots. Um, and then uh, we have to do something called a cyclic extension in order to deal with the fact that the physical layer has a number of echoes, uh, a certain delay, and multipath signature to it. But uh, just to show you that there is a, a wide variety of digital signal processing which is going on in the baseband unit, but uh, let's focus on why this solution of OFDMA or OFDM is particularly interesting for that. And that's because, as I said, I, I've showed you OFDM, but we can also think of this as uh, frequency to division multiple access. So how I can uh, share resources among multiple users. So you can see it's very easy to combine the idea of TDM and OFDM. And in, for instance, I could use a TDMA uh, TDM with OFDM in a very straightforward fashion. During uh, one time interval, I assign the OFDM signal. All of the frequencies are going to one user. Uh, and then I could have another time interval where all of my frequencies, my virtual frequencies, subcarriers, are going to the second user, etc. But I can also uh, do any kind of arbitrary mapping I want about reserving some of the subcarriers for one user, some for another user, and and having these modulated in time. So uh, I hope this uh, makes it evident to you why OFDM is a very flexible way of perhaps granularizing the data that is to be shared among mobile users. So I don't have to go in um, individual time slots or all frequencies. I can um, separate these resources and use them in a way which can be optimized as we'll be seeing and some of the optimization choices will be seen later. So this is uh, the OFDM uh, description. So going back, OFDM is the basic uh, approach to uh, any kind of multiple access scenario in the wireless domain. But now we're looking at the 5G context, and we're looking at our goals of really, really increasing capacity. So uh, we see that OFDM is interesting, flexible, but what are we going to do to get that thousand times increase in uh, capacity? Where are we going to go with that? So the physical um, layer solutions that we can use for wireless um, capacity improvement uh, can be divided up a couple of ways. But let's start with the idea of getting more coordination. So I'll be showing you how more coordination can lead me to be able to get rid of 
some of the interference among users. And most multiple access uh, systems are limited in the end by this interference. So more coordination, interference mitigation, that's really going to buy me some uh, improved, um, uh, improved performance. The other thing I can do is I can just get more cells, throw more um, locations for uh, base stations uh, in order to get more coverage, more capacity. Um, we can think of this as what's called a het net, which is sort of a heterogeneous combination. I could have some large cells, some small cells, so that's one way that we can try to increase uh, performance. And another way is using multiple antennas. So multiple antennas I can try to exploit in many different ways. Um, I'll be talking to you uh, about what is beamforming. How can we use more antennas to uh, increase performance um, by using different techniques to get directionality out of our antennas. We can also use a technique which is called multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO, and something that's very uh, 5G-centric, massive MIMO. So there are these methods that we're going to be looking at for how to increase capacity. And some of them I'll be introducing to you are LTE-like. These are solutions which are already being implemented to some degree in LTE, and we want to see expand in 5G. And the massive MIMO is really a solution which is being proposed uh, for the future 5G networks to go even farther in uh, increasing capacity. So I talked to you about frequency strategies, um, that we had this um, reutilization of frequencies, but it was really uh, difficult to manage, difficult to scale. Um, it was just too rigid, and also um, uh, if we wanted to get capacity increases just in 3G and then 4G, uh, we were really going to um, away from this idea of uh, frequency reuse. Instead, every frequency uh, was used in each cell station, and we came up with base station controls that would uh, let us uh, control um, the frequency assignment dynamically, for instance, so that um, we could use um, a frequency in one cell if the adjacent cell wasn't using it, or uh, power assignment. Some frequencies could be lower power in some cells, higher powers in others. Um, we could do something like subfrequency culling, which was meaning we're using OFDM, and if some of them uh, were uh, more touched, more influenced by interference, we could sort of not use those subfrequencies. So we found ways to be able to have a frequency, um, all frequencies at all cells, instead of this idea of reusing frequencies at a distance. Um, but although these were very effective at the interior of cell, still uh, all the problem cases come really at the boundaries of these um, cells. And that's because at the boundaries between them is when you find the greatest uh, interference because the signal is weak to this mobile because it's distant from uh, each of the two and it's seeing the networks coming from both sides. So the problems remained on the edge. And so when I talk about um, LTE frequency strategies, it's like how to be able to uh, have all frequencies at all stations and still be able to deal with this uh, interference uh, problem at the edge of the cell. One easy way to try and uh, improve um, capacity is to uh, have physical coverage of the antennas um, be um, fragmentized. So here uh, are what we call uh, sectoring. So typically we would have an omnidirectional antenna so that our um, radio could cover everybody in all directions, so that's, that's useful. But if I use something like a trisector or a six-sector, so um, antennas which uh, broadcast in one of three directions or one of six directions, then I can uh, sort of um, do some geographical uh, mapping of the frequencies, but all controlled in one base station. So for instance, if I have um, a three-sector antenna, then I could use some frequencies in this direction and maybe 
the other tower in the other directions will use those frequencies there. Or at least, if we're all using the same frequencies, that at least it's just a third of the users that are pointed in my direction and not communications for all the users. So this is a good way of uh, dealing with the interference uh, problem. So sectoring is, is a solution that we'll see in 5G, uh, like we've seen it earlier. So I, man I mentioned uh, one of the techniques which are um, being used in LTE is called the Enhanced Intercell Interference Coordination. So you can see we're using coordination here and we're dealing uh, with the uh, inter interference problem and this between two cells. So imagine we have two base stations, each servicing a mobile unit within its coverage area, and that these uh, two users are at the edge of the shell, so that they're uh, cell and they're experiencing um, some interference. So what I can do is I can coordinate these two radio heads so that they can um, tie, try and find time and frequency assignments which are orthogonal. So I told you that I liked OFDM because I could map users in the time and the frequency domain and so now by coordinating these two uh, cell sites I can make sure that when this cell site is servicing this mobile they're using resources or a combination of time and frequency slots which are different from those that are being used here. So the uh, unit mobile B is only listening for communications uh, in areas which are not being used by uh, mobile A in the other cell. So this will definitely uh, help mitigate um, the interference. And there are uh, even some uh, power strategies. So not just um, uh, the blocks of frequency and time, but also the amount of um, power which is transmitted uh, at any given time so that the um, uh, remote radio head transmissions are staggered in the time and that way we can take care of signaling that we have to uh, keep up all the time we've, then we're not doing data transfer uh, at a lower power and that they, when we go high power with data again it's also staggered on top of a uh, different time slot within the um, uh, larger time uh, frame and uh, the frequency as well. So this format, uh, EICC, can do um, coordination. And this coordination, you can see, is uh, taking place um, with the two, um, between the two cell sites. So if we were using um, a CRAN where we had a pool of baseband units, it would be easy to do this coordination because the baseband unit for this radio head would be co-located with the baseband unit for this. And so when it's time to calculate what is the good division between the two, uh, it's a coordination that could be done uh, very easily. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is using some other coordination, and this is what we call multi-point uh, coordination. And in this case, we're going to be doing something called beamforming with multiple antennas. It's kind of like sectoring, but it's programmable. Uh, when I do sectoring, I have to buy an antenna which has a certain shape and it's only good in that direction. Whereas with beamforming, we'll see that we can do uh, much more flexible um, uh, strategies. So what is beamforming? What do I mean by it? Well, we have two antennas. And I'm going to send the same data to each one of these antennas. But even though I'm sending the same data to this, I'm going to manipulate them differently. I'm going to adjust the phase of them, and I'm going to adjust the gain of them. And because of that, um, these two signals are going to each go through a different path to the receive antenna. So I have the receive antenna here. Here's a transmit antenna and, and the other transmit antenna. And they're seeing two different channels. So the experience, the path, the physical path that's being traveled by uh, these signals is different. And I quantify that in terms of a uh, frequency response. And once I know what is the frequency response between any uh, pair of antennas, that's the information I use in order to find out what kind of phase should I use, what kind of gain should I use to get the best performance 
uh, for this um, transmission. So although I have two physical antennas, their effective gain is going to be uh, maximized in the direction, the physical geographical direction of the receive antenna. Why? Because these manipulations are adapted to the channel that's being seen. So that means if the mobile moves and goes somewhere else and these channels change, I only have to reprogram this phase controller and gain controller, change the weightings in the phase and the gain of this uh, signal going to this antenna, and I'll be able to track the movement of uh, this antenna. So we can see it's a much more um, um, higher performance solution than just sectoring. So if I have beamforming, I think it would be no surprise that more antennas we have, the tighter the directionality that we can achieve. So here is a um, view of the gain as a function of uh, angle. So here we have an array of antennas. We have eight antennas lined up here. And each one of the eight antennas is receiving the same signal, but this signal is being manipulated um, differently, uh, phase and uh, amplitude. And I can literally steer this antenna so that the beam is pointing at whichever direction I want to optimize. But of course, in order to do that, I have to have information about the channel seen by each one of these antennas vis-a-vis uh, -vis the antenna of the receiver. So the gain is much higher in this direction than if I had used an omnidirectional antenna. So there are several ways that I can take this idea of beamforming and use it to coordinate my transmissions in order to get uh, good performance. For instance, um, I can use multiple trajectories, uh, multiple remote radio heads. So I showed you um, an array of antennas that were physically located uh, together, but we can imagine these arrays of antennas also as being uh, several arrays in different locations. And I could use, for instance, constructive combining to actually increase the quality of the signal, not just the gain, but, uh, but also uh, another source of gain. So think of it um, as coordinating the beef form as actually being able to point uh, different data streams at different targets. So before I was showing you one data signal, but what if I sent them a superposition of a couple data signals and the coordinates were chosen so that I could actually send this data to this mobile, this data to that mobile, etc. So I can have multiple pointing. So that uh, is uh, much better than the omnidirectional um, solution. So I can point different data streams at different targets. And of course I need um, coordination for that uh, to do it effectively. So all of this beamforming requires accurate channel state information. Channel state information, what does that mean? That's what I was talking about is the um, behavior, the, the path that is seen between the transmit uh, and the receive antennas. And there might be multiple transmit antennas, maybe even multiple receive antennas. So I have to have a channel characterization between each antenna pair. Now, in general, I have to have that information at the base station. But the base station doesn't know where the mobile is, so the mobile has to look back at the base station, see what the channel looks like, find this, estimate this channel state information, and then send that information back to the remote, uh, to the baseband unit, so that it can be used to calculate the coefficients for the beamforming. So that means I need a back channel that gets the information to the central controller. And of course, it's more complex DSP um, in order to achieve beamforming, either in the estimating the channel state information or just in um, uh, calculating and delivering the coefficients to the multiple antennas. So clearly, I need a central controller.
And if I have a CRAM, if I have cold baseband units, this suddenly becomes much easier to do than in uh, uh, a system where the baseband units could be physically separated and have their own delay and, and backhaul in between the two of them. So as I mentioned, there are a couple ways that you could uh, use um, coordination in order to get good uh, performance. Like an easy one would be um, just taking the channel state information from different radio heads and saying, you know, this base station saying, you know what, uh, looking at what you're seeing and uh, to this mobile and this mobile, it'd be much better if I took the upper mobile, you take the lower mobile because that's what the CSI is looking for. Um, or, you know, we can, when we find out we're tracking the CSI and things change, we can flip it over and go the other way. So, um, in order to do this, we could use um, beam forming when we have the channel state. So it's my turn, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to form a beam towards this person. And, uh, okay, my beam is stronger now, so let's switch over. And, of course, this coordination is a lot easier when everything is co-located. I think I mentioned that one thing we could do is actually taking um, multiple. So suppose now I have multiple radio heads. Uh, each with a vision towards a mobile, and that mobile is on the edge of all of these and, and doesn't have good coverage. Well, you could actually have these radio heads um, coordinated so that each one has their signal delayed so that it arrives at the mobile just the right time, and the mobile can add these coherently in uh, order to have constructive combining and actually get uh, a gain from each one of the ones that's being serviced. So we can see that this is a way to get uh, much better performance. Of course, it's much better if I have lightly loaded systems because if I have a whole lot of mobiles, this is going to take resources more than I have, perhaps. But in places which um, have the range for it, this can get uh, very good performance. So I've gone over the LTE-like solutions, and now I'd like to talk to you about the solution which is uh, really uh, being uh, groomed to cover 5G. And for that, I'll be talking about massive MIMO, uh, which is multiple input, multiple output. So we saw with beamforming that our solution was to go to multiple antennas. And let's face it, it's wireless. I cannot lay another cable or fiber to increase capacity. If I want to create additional channels. Um, I've already done it using the time domain and the frequency domain. So what can I do? Well, I can increase additional channels by using multiple antennas. So multiple antennas here is something different from what I was talking about earlier. When I was talking about earlier about multiple antennas for beamforming, then I'm using all of those antennas in order to just take one signal and make it better, point it at a user. Now I'm talking about using multiple antennas to actually increase capacity. So every time I add an antenna, either at the transmit side or at the receive side, I could be creating essentially another path, another way, another spatial path of conveying information to uh, the users, um, which could be a way of multiplying the number of channels available, and therefore increasing capacity. So these paths that come from different antennas, they can be um, combined, selected. There are different strategies I can use. So it's not just beamforming. So in terms of MIMO is where I'm going. I want to talk about multiple input and multiple output, but I'm really talking now just about multiple antennas. What can we do? Well, there's all kinds of ways that we can configure multiple antennas to use it. Um, so we have single input, multiple output, CMO, MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, CISO, single input, single output. Well, let's face it, that's not multiple antennas. That's a single antenna. That's the traditional one. So we often use that as our baseline for comparison, the CISO. And multiple input, um, single output. And multiple input single output is uh, something we saw with the beam forming uh, is uh, um, multiple antennas and a single at the base station and a single antenna at the um, uh, mobile. 
intuitively, I think that you will say more antennas are better. We saw with beamforming that more antennas made for a tighter um, directional beam, which led to more gain. Now we're talking about increasing capacity, not just making the signal better, but being able to support more signals uh, when we use it in uh, the ways I'll be describing. Uh, and this um, so could be used for a single user. It could be a way of increasing the total throughput available to a single user, or it can be used for multiple users, which is more likely the case of what we would like to achieve in the cellular environment. So there are the single user varieties and the multi-user varieties of how I would exploit this idea of multiple intensity, intens um, multiple antennas. So we have um, some simple diversity techniques I'll be talking about, some ways that we can use pre-coding with these multiple antenna systems to increase capacity, and finally how we can use spatial multiplexing as a way of increasing uh, throughput. So I'll take you through uh, the different ways uh, that we can exploit these multiple antennas other than beamforming. So let's start with the diversity methods which are the easiest. So antenna diversity is a way uh, of improving performance when we don't have any channel state information. So and for beamforming, the only way we could use multiple, the, if we wanted to use beamforming for multiple antennas, we had to have channel state information. If we use multiple antennas and just had diversity, we could improve. Um, and this works best when the paths are independent. What that means is when I'm placing my antennas, I don't want them to be too close to one another. Because if they're too close to one another, they're pretty much going to see the same path. And then I won't get uh, any advantage from the presence of more than one. But if they're sufficiently separated so that their paths look independent, then there could be some uh, big advantages. So let's look at the um, simplest variety, which is a single input, multiple output. So I have one, um, let, let's look from the mobile to the base station. I have a mobile with a single antenna, and at the radio head I have multiple antennas. Each one of them is receiving that signal. Well, I can process all the antennas and just choose which one's best. Or um, I could do some combining as well. I could also do something called uh, space-time coding. And in space-time coding, I take the same signal and I send that same signal on multiple antennas, but each copy has a special code. A special code. So before, I was only using um, gain and um, amplitude in order to form the beam. But in the case of space-time coding, this is something where I could put um, something that uh, makes each of the each of the signals on each one of the antennas distinguishable to the receiver. It's distinguishable, separable from each one of them, and so the receiver can take them, combine them, uh, decode them, decode them first, and then combine them, and I can get much better performance uh, by doing uh, that. But again, um, this does not necessarily have to use channel state information, whereas if I wanted to uh, create the coefficients for the beamforming, I would have to have the channel state information. Whereas the space-time coding, I'm putting the coding on top of them, which lets the receiver figure out, if you will, what those coefficients should be and do it at the receiver end instead of the transmitter end. So we consider this a diversity technique because channel state information is not being used. So pre-coding methods, well, this is a little bit like uh, beamforming. So conventional beamforming uses the same data at each antenna, just the different phase and gain. But in this case, I have multiple streams, so different data. Um, each data has different delays in addition to having um, maybe different phases and gains. So, so, so it's delayed on top of the... Um, others. And so now when we um, uh, combine them, we can uh, achieve, uh, overcome, take advantage of multipath, which is present in the um, transmission in order to um, recover different copies of the same signal 
at delays, at different delays. Again, um, this requires channel state information, but it works even when there's no line of sight. And I guess this is an important distinction between beamforming and the precoding. Beamforming, you saw we were making it directional. We were pointing a beam at a mobile. But what happens if the mobile is blocked? There's an obstruction in between the antennas. Well, we still can get good communication because even if the direct line of sight is blocked, we could have reflections that gives us a non-line of sight um, communication. And in this case, um, the um, multi-stream version is going to take care of that multipath created by um, uh, many different reflections finally arriving at it. Um, so it uh, works even in these strong multipath, no line of sight uh, channels, which would not have worked with the beam forming. So that takes us to uh, spatial multiplexing. And this is uh, using MIMO technology, multiple input multiple output. So we have many antennas at both the receiver and the transmitter. And now we're using a DSP that allows us to actually create the equivalent of separate channels. So this is uh, taking the idea of adding an antenna in order to add another channel. So I can't lay another fiber, I can't lay another cable, but if I add another antenna I can create the equivalent of another channel. And so we think about this, now we're sending different data on each one of the antennas and it's directed towards uh, a different uh, uh, user, for instance. This definitely requires channel state information. It can be receiver only if we want to avoid the back channel, but this can be very complex. Um, we need, for instance, we could use something called reciprocity, which means at the... Um, Suppose I wanted to do um, the multiplexing from the um, transmitter side at the base station. I can send a beam to the mobile. The mobile could estimate the channel. A back channel sends that information. Reciprocity means what the mobile saw would be what I would see if I was looking, so I can use the same information. Um, processing can be complex in order to achieve this um, ability to distinguish the information transmitted on a different antenna, even though it's on the same frequency and the same time slot. Uh, how can I keep things apart and not have them interfere with one another? So there's MIMO processing, which lets you separate out um, this information. And it's pretty complex. But the solutions, I said OFDM was kind of nice, if you remember, way back when. I said OFDM was nice because it was robust to the vagaries of the channel, and also it was easy to equalize things. So the equalizer in OFDM is very simple. And now when I try to expand the equalization to take into equalizing not just one channel between one pair of antennas, but to eliminate um, competing channels from other antennas, it's easier to do with OFDM. So how well I am able to create actual parallel channels from having multiple antennas depends a lot on the rich, richness of the transmission environment. So I already said that uh, even for diversity techniques that we had to have the independence of the channels. And also we would like to have them to be pretty um, um, similar in other aspects. Um, for instance, if I get a lot of fading on one, I'm going to lose that channel because the, the, the the gain of the power of the signal is going to go right down. So there are some constraints in order to achieve um, this uh, um, added uh, uh, capacity. But um, it's definitely uh, possible um, in, in typical cellular systems. So the multi-user uh, versions, um, we have to think of this in the cellular environment where the Downlink is a broadcast channel and can have multiple antennas. And typically the um, handsets will have fewer antennas, maybe more than one, maybe two, but you generally fewer than the base station. Base station just uh, physically much larger can accommodate uh, more, more antennas. So in the multi-user 
uh, MIMO, the, challenge, um, the channel state information can be very challenging because um, e each one of the um, antennas in the um, base station, it has a receiver and transmitter RF chain that is known. It's present. It's um, uh, accessible to the centralized unit. But each one of the mobiles has a set which is uh, very physically separated and different. It has different timing, different oscillators for their um, frequencies. Um, so reciprocity I talked about was good for the part of the system which is uh, propagation, but it's not so good for the part which is the RF chain. So multi-user is possible, but it has some uh, challenges. I think it's kind of interesting, this uh, idea of how to explain what it is that um, massive MIMO is doing when we have a whole lot of um, antennas in this broadcast uh, system. So the idea is I want to send some information. Maybe this massive MIMO is the information I want to send. And think of the base stations as communicating with each one of the mobiles, learning about the um, environment, the set of um, uh, stations out there, and making a map of it so it knows where the trouble areas are. Now, you could just send that information um, and try to maybe make your signal stronger so it'll go over that. But if you can actually shape the information that you're sending so that you can not be bothered by these trouble spots. And so the analogy is, um, uh, calls the algorithm that achieves this writing on dirty paper because it's a way of sending your message in such a way that although the signal, the channel is not perfect, the imperfections of the channel are sort of lined up with the data so that things uh, can go through better. Anyway, that's just a little um, way to try to make you appreciate uh, what the algorithms going on in the baseband unit are achieving by taking uh, this channel state information, information about the quality of transmissions for every given uh, pair. So I've gone through a lot of physical layer with you, and maybe it's the first time you're seeing some of this. So what are what's the message? What's the takeaways I want you to get from this? Is that first of all, the physical layer capacity can be increased. We don't we have we know how to do it. It takes some complex algorithms. It takes a lot of baseband unit, and uh, it requires a lot of coordination. We have to gather lots of channel state information. We've got to coordinate that information, get it into the algorithm so it can be exploited. And we have to coordinate that information so we can have strategies on how we'd like to tailor each one of those data streams in order to optimize the overall uh, throughput of the system. So it re requires coordination that the information be available and it be available to all the participants. And it requires cooperation. So we're, we're gathering lots of CSI, CSI from different places, and we would like to have a way where it would be easy for these units to cooperate and share, um, not just share the information, but exploit that information. So we need something to orchestrate the coverage and the handling, and maybe the handoff, of units uh, in all of this. So this is what I've tried to show you on each one of the physical layer approaches to how we increase performance. And you can see now that if we look back at what the physical layer needs in order to increase capacity, these are all things that can be achieved if we move to the cloud RAN. Because now we have a baseband unit pool. And this pooling of resources, besides being easy to maintain, um, lowering uh, um, um, the power consumption, uh, maybe being able to be lower cost because we're using commoditized sources. It's also key in order to just get the physical layer improvements that we need. Which brings us to our last topic, which are the challenges in front hall. Why don't we have CRAN now if its promise is so glowing, if there are so many um, capacity increases that we can achieve 
by the Centralization and Coordination Cooperation in a CRAM? Well, the reason are the following. It's what we call the front hall challenges. So let's look at what we talked about. Why was CRAN so great? It was because of the resource optimization that we can achieve. It was based on getting accurate channel in-state information, which means uh, in the time varying channels, we have to be able to get this channel state information updated very frequently. So the delay must be low. So we require that the front hall network have very low delay. We want to increase uh, capacity, which means that we are going to be optimizing the CSI across all the visible uh, remote radio heads and mobiles to reduce information, uh, excuse me, to reduce interference and combine contributions from multiple uh, our remote radio heads. So we um, have to get all these kinds of information uh, in a timely factor in order to do the resource optimization we would like to achieve. So what do we mean by front hall again? Just let's look at it again. Front hall is the network that can can connects the remote radio heads to the pool of baseband units. Um, and the baseband units then are connected to the um, mobile telephone switching office or to the, the core network via a uh, backhaul. So this backhaul um, Let's say you can get um, from a baseband unit back to the central office, you can get, let's say, a gigabit per second. Maybe you can get more, but in it, something on the order of a gigabit per second. And the SIPRI link, that is the link, the standard, the protocol used to connect these remote radio heads to the baseband unit, um, the digital version of the analog signals are actually up to 12 gigabits per second. So we can see that the front hall requirements are much greater than the back hall requirements. So we're trying to create a network which is much higher performance even than the performance of the back hall. And let's see why. Why does this uh, come about? And the reason is the way that the CIPRI protocol has been uh, written. So remember, the CIPRI, the idea is that we would take the in-phase and quadrature um, signatures for the data um, and uh, get them up to the uh, radio and we would be able to take this, this um, CIPRI is able to um, be used for a variety of modulation formats although it once it's used it's for one modulation format and it could cover uh, many frequency bands so in trying to facilitate these capabilities they allow themselves to um, be not spectrally efficient. So they did not have the CRAN in mind as the long-range solution. They really developed SIPRI for the RAN environment, which was a much simpler uh, environment. So let's take a look at what the SIPRI protocol is requiring. So we have over here maybe um, communications with the mobile, and they were communicating uh, 150 megabits per second. And let's say the mobile has two antennas and the remote radio head has two antennas. So we're going to do 2 by 2 MIMO for this um, solution. So let's say that in this 150 megabits per second, we're getting that through in a pretty spectrally efficient manner of about 20 megahertz. When I have to digitize the radio signal in the 20 megahertz band, the SIPRI uh, rate required is 2.5 gigabits per second. So although I'm only providing 150 megabits of data, I have to use um, a back uh, front hall, which is two and a half gigabits per second. So very spectrally inefficient. And of course, once my baseband unit does all the processing, I'm going to reduce it back to this 150 megabits, megabits which is why my back hall doesn't have to be that big. Back hall just has to be big enough to accumulate all of the data at each one of the mobiles. So um, typically we would do this, uh, CIPRI was used at dark fibers, fibers that weren't being used uh, uh, in general and could be uh, deployed for this use. And if we look at um, some other scenarios, if we want to go 
uh, 2 by 2 MIMO. Remember I said it was 20 megahertz channel, so we went from 150 to 2.5 gigabits per second. And if we're looking at more aggressive MIMO, if we're trying to do maybe eight antennas at the um, mobile site, and uh, excuse me, eight antennas at the remote radio head and two antennas at the mobile site, and we're doing these 20 megahertz, now we're up to 10 gigabits per second. And um, this is just um, for one, one channel. And of course, there are multiple channels in parallel which are being used at the LTE um, center. So the expansion in bandwidth is really considerable. And this means that the capacity is going to be very difficult to achieve on the front hall. So let's make this uh, conclusion simple. We think that CRAN has great potential. It can reduce cost. It can increase capacity. It can ease maintenance and upgrades. It even has a proven track record in early adoption in some simple CRAN scenarios with some simple um, some goals. But the scalability is the big, big issue. So front hall is the question that is limiting adoption of CRAN. And to understand, I gave you a few points about 2x2 two two MIMO and a 20 megahertz, uh, 120 megahertz channel. But I tell you that in 5G, we're looking at massive MIMO, how to get this thousand times increase in capacity. And when I'm talking about massive, I'm talking about three sectors with 64 antennas. So the front hall problem is immense. So there's much research underway trying to massage the SIPRI protocol uh, to make it more efficient, do some compression. But ultimately, um, it's still a research question. How are we going to find the enablers at the physical layer to make this front hall possible? And that will be the subject of some of my uh, other discussions in the following weeks. So thank you for your attention.